Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the ninth meeting of the Justice Committee in 2015? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they interfere with broadcasting, even when switched to silent? No apologies have been received. Item 1. I ask the Committee to agree to consider Item 3, a draft Stage 1 report on the Prisoners Control of the East Scotland Bill and our work programme in private. Are you agreed? Thank you. Item 2. This is our third evidence session on the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill. We'll hear from two panels of witnesses. I welcome our first panel, Paul Broadbent, Chief Executive Gangmasters Licensing Authority, and Helen Martin, Assistant Secretary to the STUC. And I'll move straight on to questions from members, please. Margaret. Um, good morning. I wonder if I could start with Mr um, Broadbent and ask a little bit about um, the role accommodation plays in attracting people here who are then subsequently um, trafficked. I I'm aware there's um, often adverts which turn out to be quite misleading, uh, often attaching accommodation and employment. And if you could just um, talk a little bit more about that, that would be very helpful. I can indeed. Thank you very much. Um, oh, yes, sorry, your, your microphone comes on automatically. Right. Thank you. And if you wish to come in, if it's not directed, the question not directed <laughs> at you specifically, just indicate to me and I'll call you. OK? Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, there are currently 68 gangmasters licences in Scotland. Um, attached to those 68 are conditions that if a gangmaster uh, advertises and provides uh, transport, accommodation and other means, that they should be of a sufficient standard for a reasonable person to reside in. Uh, quite often, though, uh, either some gangmasters subcontract the accommodation issue or they don't provide uh, or advertise accommodation at all, and it's left to the worker to find their own accommodation. That, in our experience, is where the problems lie, uh, because there are so many uh, rogue landlords uh, and people willing to charge exorbitant fees for not just substandard accommodation, uh, but woefully inadequate accommodation. Uh, and that forms part of our inquiries. Um, but where a gangmaster, as I've said, doesn't advertise any uh, accommodation at all, uh, that's where the problems lie. So what we try to do with the 68 gangmasters uh, in Scotland, uh, all of whom at this point in time uh, are compliant, I don't think anybody applies to be a gang master if they intend uh, to break the law. Um, but with those 68, uh, there are in total 209 gang masters across the UK who supply labour into Scotland. So it's not just the 68 uh, who are registered officers in Scotland. There's 209 in total who supply labour into. Um, we made sure that, uh, as far as we possibly can do, that the accommodation they provide... Uh, is of a sufficient standard and it complies with our licensing standards. If it doesn't, that licence can be revoked. We can uh, in place additional licensing standards to give them a period of time to improve that accommodation. Uh, but overall, our work is much more and more with the unlicensed gangmaster, also known as the criminal. Uh -huh. uh, how is this picked up? Um, is it are adverts monitored? Um, how are the checks done you know, to bring this to light? Is it through complaints, for example, from local authorities, maybe of overcrowding and uh, subsequent noise that then unearths these, um, these abuses? It's through all of those means. Uh, it's it's intelligence-led uh, almost entirely because people will advertise that they've got good accommodation and it's only by looking or a snippet of intelligence from a member of the public to say next door seems to house um, a disproportionate amount of people that may be coming in and out almost in shifts because that's a, a typical pattern as well. Uh, changes in day and night or uh, between 10 and 20 people living in a small house. So we receive uh, intelligence uh, from Police Scotland, uh, from local authorities, uh, from licensed gang masters themselves who don't want tarnished with the same kind of operation as the unlicensed gang masters use. So, so we unashamedly receive intelligence from all and every source, uh, anonymously as well, and we will act on that intelligence to see whether it, there's any basis from it. And is there a particular type of um, employment linked to, to the kind of accommodation that tends to be um, abused? 
Uh, we did a, a recent job uh, last year, the year before, which was Operation Rego. Uh, there was two operations in the Fraserburgh uh, and uh, Peterhead uh, environment in the northeast of Scotland, uh, where we discovered, with the local authority, a number of, uh, uh, firstly, uh, unlicensed landlords, uh, and some of the legislation and regulation in that local area was certainly tightened up uh, to prevent the exploitation of people into uh, substandard accommodation. And can I ask, Ms Martin, the extent to, to which you're aware of, of that link? Um, well, from the trade union point of view, we have a slightly different kind of relationship with these sorts of issues, given that uh, where we tend to organise, um, our members tend to be obviously the better end of the sector. The fact that the trade union movement is in a workplace tends to mean that it's a better quality workplace than some of the other ones. From our point of view, I think there is a link between general exploitation that you see within society and, uh, and issues of traffic and enforced labour. Um, and I think we are quite clear that we need to see the tackling of trafficking as um, on a spectrum of tackling a wider range of abuse. So a tackling accommodation abuse would be one of those things that we might want to try and do to make sure that people aren't being then subsequently abused in other ways. But um, we should also think about other sort of labour market issues around, you know, very poor quality contracts, breaches in the minimum wage, other sorts of things that we know are happening within industries that wouldn't necessarily constitute the severe end of labour, labour abuse such as trafficking, but open the door to that form of abuse. And we would like to see this more as a spectrum of issues rather than simply trying to look at the, the most severe thing and tackle that in it without thinking about the other stuff. Are you confident the balance is right? By looking at the wider spectrum, you're not maybe you know, neglecting the, the potential and the training to spot trafficking? No, 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 because um, to be clear, I think it's very important that we do that as well. And in my submission, I did talk about the need to make sure that public sector workers who might come into contact with trafficking are properly trained. And I think the Scottish Government is now starting to do a bit more of a focus on that. And we, we would welcome that and hope that this is something that this bill really rolls out in full. But I think the point, the, the, the bigger point that I'm trying to make is that if we focus simply on tackling trafficking and we ignore wider labour markets, market abuses, we are unlikely actually to get very far in tackling trafficking. Um, that actually it is much better to tackle the abuse that we can see, that is quite visible, that we know is happening. And um, that helps create sectors that are better organised, better run, that have a mixture of a workforce in it as well, because we often find that a particularly vulnerable workforce, an immigrant workforce, is particularly vulnerable, and immigrant workforces tend to work in sectors where they're, being, where they're likely to receive bad contracts, poor levels of pay. So if you raise the quality in the workforce, bring more Scottish people into it, as not to do down immigrant workers, we, we would welcome immigrant workers working as well, but the point is, the better quality the jobs, the better the workforce functions, the, more, the less likely you're, you are to have trafficking of anyone. Can I think we would dispute the, the general context of what you're saying to improve working conditions and contracts and so on across the spectrum. But we've got to focus on this bill that's before us. And really, I'd like you both in your evidence to focus on what in this bill, not saying what you're saying is incorrect, but to keep the focus tight on how we improve or where this bill is falling in, in, in your requirements as you're out uh, in, on the shop floor and the, the, the work face and so on. Could you, um, um, you see what I'm saying? If we go too far, <laughs> why do we miss question. the focus? <laughs> yeah. Where does, does the bill do it? Yes, so, so can you... Well, just someone focus. else can ask that. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll go, I'll go to Christian now. It was, it's not wrong what you were saying, it's just that we've got to deal with this and do a report on it. Christian. Yeah, thank you very much, Governor. Yeah, particularly on the bill, what I would like to understand is, as the Gang Master Licenses Authority uh, from you, uh, how, how we are, uh, do we have an increase of, uh, of, uh, of illegal activities, uh, particularly in some sectors that you didn't have before? Can you give us a picture of where we are? Yes, um, actually, there, is, there has been an increase in unlicensed activity, mm -hmm. uh, which could manifest itself as forced labour, compulsory labour, domestic servitude, or even human trafficking. But I actually believe that increase has been a result of public awareness, 
and public authorities' awareness and an increased understanding of the issue, as opposed to there is more human trafficking uh, out there at this time. Uh, and that has been evidenced through the increase in intelligence that we're getting now from sources that we didn't get intelligence from before. So I don't think there's been an increase in human trafficking or the offences covered uh, in the Act. I think the increase in public awareness and public authority awareness has given us more information with which to work. Do you think this bill will provide more awareness again, which will in turn bring uh, an increased activity for, for, you, for yourself? A absolutely. Uh, attached uh, to the bill, the non-legislative uh, activities that are talked around, the, the strategy, some of those will in, in, uh, involve awareness raising and training uh, across the board for people on the front line, even more so on the front line than, uh, than myself and Helen. So, yes, that is the next stage, I believe. As a question will come then, can you cope? Um, this activity. We're, we're up to capacity and capability as we are now, uh, but we will do our very best uh, to do more with increasingly less as austerity moves even further. Is there anything in the bill that you would have liked to see to try uh, to, uh, to address the problem you talked about, which was the difference between the, two, the, the, uh, the 68 uh, uh, you have in Scotland and the 209 uh, in the UK, is there any way we can more uh, legislify for, for this to make sure that you don't have this 209 who can maybe come and having different standards than the 68 that you have? I think the bill actually suits the purposes of the Gang Masters Licensing Authority very well at this moment in time. Okay, thank you very much. What about STUC? You, you did say that uh, you had a uh, 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 some concern about uh, this increased activity and the GLA will maybe not be able to cope with it? Uh, yes, we um, have long been concerned about the under, uh, the under resourcing of the Grand Masters Licensing Agency and uh, we have repeatedly called for them to have a much better resource because actually we think they're, they're a very important organisation, that they do a very good job of inspection and regulation, something that we really need more of. Um, we also believe that their remit is too narrow in the sectors that they focus on and that there is a real need to increase the number of sectors covered by the Gang Masters Licensing Agency. But there isn't a huge amount of point in increasing someone's remit if you're not properly resourcing them to do that. I think they, they are on the resource to do the remit that they have. Um, so we would like to see them properly resourced and then the remit widened or a similar organisation created to do other sectors. Can, can we be more specific on the sector, if you, you think? Uh, yeah, correct? well, for example, fisheries sector is a, is, a, is a real area where we would have concerns about the maritime sector. Uh, we have had concerns about construction in the past, though we aren't particularly concerned about that sector at, at present. However, there is a huge amount of labour abuse in the construction sector, and it, it has the potential things change over, over, uh, over time given economic con conditions and it kind of has the potential to be one where uh, a better system of regulation w would prevent trafficking in, in the future. Would you back up uh, Paul Bodent, uh, um, evidence giving his evidence that uh, uh, there, there is not such a thing than an increase really of exploitation, it's more an increase of the awareness of what's happening, what Paul just said regarding the increase of, uh, of uh, illegality uh, regarding trafficking. It's not so much uh, the, 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 the increase happening, but the awareness happening, meaning that we are more aware of, uh, of the activity taking place. Um, I think that's nearly certainly the case. Um, I'm, and I'm pretty sure Paul would have a better insight into some of these issues than I would. I think that there are structural issues, however, that do make trafficking more or less likely. We're concerned about domestic workers and uh, issues around the exploitation of domestic workers that are likely to have been made worse by the changes in the Tier 5 visa system. Again, this is about things that are happening at Westminster, but um, it's, I think it's important to remember that this creates a kind of context that we need to take into account when we are doing our anti-trafficking work here in Scotland. I think there's also real 
issues within the uh, maritime sector in particular that are structural about how that sector works, that um, if we were really going serious about tackling trafficking within that sector, we would need to think about these issues, even though it is much broader than this, than a bill like this can do. So I think there are, there are issues that we need to think about within the context of writing legislation, but I think it's also important that we, we focus on what the anti-trafficking strategy is going to do and all the different mechanisms that we have as the Scottish Government and as the UK Government at our, at our, at our disposal to tackle trafficking in the round. Thank you, Mr. West. Just a last point. Do you think that this bill's weight is, uh, will help decrease the, the illegal activities? Um, I think it's a good start. I think there are things that this bill could do that would help support that. Um, we were somewhat concerned about the fact that there isn't a huge amount of prevention focus within the bill. Um, and as such, we thought that there were some changes that could be made to the bill to give a better prevention focus. Um, the first being the criminalisation of the purchase of sex. I think that uh, helps change, disrupt the market that exists for, for prostitution at the minute and, would, and has been shown in other countries to provide uh, a good basis for um, eradicating trafficking within that sector. Uh, secondly, I think it would be useful if this bill established an independent um, trafficking commissioner in Scotland. I understand that the Westminster bill is is creating a trafficking commissioner and that will cover Scotland, but we are hugely worried about the independence of that commissioner and we also think that it's far too law enforcement focused. We would much rather see one in Scotland that provides a focal point for, for work in Scotland and I think that it is an opportunity for this bill to do that. Um, and thirdly, we would like to see a wee bit more put into the bill about how it is that the, tra the, um, the anti-trafficking strategy is developed and who needs to be consulted within that. that ha those sorts of things have gone into bills in the past and I think give a really good sort of legislative footing to how it is that we develop this work in the future. Thank you. Just before I move on, can I just ask um, the Gang Masters Licensing Association, what is your funding? Where do you get it? Um, if, if you made a comment about cuts, you made a comment that might be under-resourced. Could you tell me what your source of funding is and how much it is? The, the source of funding is £2.68 million. Pounds, from? Uh, uh, from Westminster. Uh, from? Uh, sorry, £4.168 from Westminster and £100,000 uh, from the Department of Justice in Northern Ireland. I see. So, at the moment, is there any contribution from the Scottish Government? No, there isn't. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify what the position was with your funding source. Roderick von der Allison, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, good morning. Uh, to some degree, you've covered some of the points I was going to raise, but if I can just focus a bit more on the legislation. Um, it's Martin. Uh, do I take it that uh, you haven't any specific comments on kind of clause four, the slavery servitude enforced? or compulsory labour point. Are you happy with the way that's drafted? Uh, and you were talking about abuses, wider labour abuses, and I wasn't quite sure, uh, whilst taking on board what the convener said earlier, whether you had any particular concerns as to the drafting of the forced labour clause. Um, not, in, not in and of itself. We were a little bit concerned about the general definition of trafficking and the fact that there was a real focus on travel. I think you've received yeah. quite a lot yeah. of evidence on this I, I, point. I, we got that um, point, yeah. yeah. so we would sort of share the wider concern that there needs to be perhaps more, more, more wording that is in line with the European Directive. But the actual points on, for, on compulsory labour itself, we aren't massively concerned about. We think that it's a reasonable definition and, and we hope that it will provide a good legislative footing. Okay. And in terms of the, the, the section which deals with the, the strategy, um, again, in terms of drafting terms, what, what would you like to see in, in that, bearing in mind what you said, section 31, part 5? Section 31. Um, yeah, we did have some concern about how this was drafted. Sorry if I just find the... Um, we felt that um, the, the actual specific points that it says that it's going to do, they tend to focus quite a lot about on raising awareness. Uh, there's a number of, there's two of the bullet points that essentially go to raising awareness. Yeah. Um, and we felt that that was perfectly reasonable for the short term, but wasn't necessarily 
future proof in the strategy because you know there comes a point when raising awareness of the legislation is something that you hope hopefully have achieved and that you might want to go on and do other things the second bullet point does start to to get behind arrangements to facilitate the detention prevention and and that conduct but um, we felt that you know the, the way the legislation is drafted at the minute it does suggest that more of an emphasis will be done on raising awareness of the bill than it will be done on prevention and 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 enf enforcement just the way just the the way the bullet points are drafted so we kind of thought it's a small point, but I kind of thought that that wasn't necessarily a, a fantastic signal, that there maybe should be more within that that talks very strongly about the need to prevent trafficking from happening in the first place and the need to disrupt the markets that facilitate trafficking. We also felt that it would be important to put within this section um, a clause that requires consultation when drafting or refreshing the strategy with trade unions, with civil society organisations, with people like the gangmasters. Yeah. Um, because I think it's important that we do take a range of evidence from people within sectors about what is happening within Scotland at the minute, because that can change as well from one year to the next, depending on you know, labour market environments. Um, so in, in your view, in terms of consultation, kind of... Uh, the kind of a range of stakeholders needs to be set out in Bill 1. Yes, I think yeah. that, that is a helpful approach. That is something that we've well, done in the past in bills. Obviously, one of the disadvantages of a, of a strategy is that, and a bill is that it needs to be flexible and not too prescriptive. But uh, I take your point on consultation. The problem is if you put a list of people or any yeah. lists on the face of a bill, and you want to add anything to it or subtract from it, then you've got to amend the legislation, which is yeah. cumbersome. Uh, and I think I would share Roderick Campbell's view that you keep it flexible. Well, we, we have taken a view in the past as, as trade unions that actually if you keep that list relatively tight and, um, and talk about people who are absolutely key to be, um, to be consulted, that that does create an impetus to actually consult those key people and um, it also doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have a clause that says on anyone else you find appropriate so yeah at the end yeah. but we do we have done this in other bills and we have found it a very useful clause that has helped the actual creation of policy in the longer term thank you that's helpful thank you uh, alison followed by john followed by lane Christian explored much of what I wanted to um, discuss, but perhaps uh, be interested in GLA's, uh, Mr Broadbent, in your response to the STUC's claim that it would be beneficial to expand the remit of the organisation. It's a, a question I get asked on a, on a regular basis. Um, and as a public <laughs> servant, uh, the, the official line would be that um, we have enough to do within the GLA regulated se sector. However, what I am aware of uh, is that we only regulate a third of the temporary labour market in the UK. Yeah. So that would be agriculture, uh, fish and food processing only, so not fishing. If it lays on the seabed and it's dragged up, we, uh, it's regulated. If it's swimming in the sea, it's not, and that is an anomaly, uh, I feel. Uh, and we certainly don't cover construction, renovation, warehousing, care homes and the like. Um, so um, to go back to, to Mr Allard's point, I haven't seen a marked increase in exploitation in the GLA regulated sector, but that's not to say there hasn't been an increase in exploitation in areas that we don't regulate. Uh, and often where we find information of exploitation in areas that we don't regulate, we need to pass that on, and we do quickly to the police or other authorities that they can make investigations. Uh, one frustration I do have um, is that if someone is GLA compliant in our sector, abiding by our rules, our standards, but sometimes a licensed gangmaster will operate a different business model outside of the GLA regulated sector, which if it was in our sector yeah. would fail our standards. That's a concern. So appreciating that you say you've got quite enough to do, but would it make sense, um, rather than setting up a separate regulator for other industries, to um, draw on the experience that your organisation has and to, and to expand that organisation, providing the resources were there to do that? It would, yes. Yes. Thank you. That's a matter for the UK. 
Yes. Yeah. But is there any prospect of it? I haven't followed this in, at Westminster. Is there any prospect of these gaps or extending the remit to the GLE? I'm aware different conversations are taking place in committees uh, such as this across the UK, but nothing firm has been put down uh, at Thank all. You. Thank you very much. We might want to pursue that if the committee does by writing uh, to the Justice Committee at Westminster and see what they're going to do about it. John, followed by Lee. Good morning, panel. Thank you both for your evidence. Uh, I, I'm aware of what the convener said, Ms Martin, there, but um, as I understood it, the, the abuse of labour generally you were seen as, as, as something that, if properly addressed, could in some way be part of a preventive process. Is that correct? Yes, that's, a, that's exactly it, because um, from our point of view, we're reasonably clear that where you start to see trafficking or start to hear reports of trafficking or workers held in different forms of bonded labour or, you know, uh, having their passports taken off them, sort of really poor, um, quite worrying abuses, is in the sorts of places where you're already seeing quite abusive practices happening. Um, these sorts of things tend to be associated with uh, companies that uh, have quite long supply chains that use quite a lot of temporary labour, that use, uh, you know, quite poor models of contracts that and where minimum wage abuses are known to happen either legally or illegally. And, and I know from your evidence you prefer a, a statutory basis to address some of these issues, but you also refer to something called the Ethical Trading Initiative. Can you expand a bit on that and what role, if any, it could play in addressing some of the factors? That we're talking about. Yeah, the Ethical Trading Initiative is, a, is an organisation that brings together trade unions and employers and it has an, a kind of international um, standing in that it looks at um, how labour markets function around the, the world and it uh, has created what's known as the Base Code which uh, sets down a, a list of principles that employers um, would have to follow in order to make sure that they are treating their workforce fairly and to make sure that they are, um, you know, providing products that get sold then into the UK that don't um, come with a lot of exploitation attached to them. Uh, it's a reasonably good model in that it uh, provides a, a template of what you would actually require a company to do, the sorts of checks that they would have to follow in order to make sure that uh, they aren't abusing their workforce or inadvertently um, kind of taking contracts from other uh, other people who are abusing their workforce. And um, it's a part of a much wider movement that we're seeing at the minute around um, human rights and business. And that is something that the Scottish, the UK government has signed up to and, and Scotland should be enacting things around human rights and business, which means that businesses are responsible for what happens in their wider supply chain. So supermarkets, for example, would be responsible for what happens in the food processing sector. Um, hotels would be responsible for what's happening to, to the workers who are potentially cleaning their rooms or coming in and doing services in the hotel that aren't, but they aren't directly employed by the hotel. It means that, you know, all of a sudden you can't just say, well, I took the cheapest contract and I never thought why it was the cheapest. All of a sudden a business has a responsibility to look at what's actually happening within their supply chains and to make sure that they're upholding human rights. Because ultimately what we're talking about when we're talking about slavery is the complete breach of someone's human rights, the complete breach of their freedom of movement, their, their freedom of dignity. So I think this is a, a really important issue and we need to recognise the fact that employers and businesses are legitimate actors to place um, requirements onto. And as the Scottish Government, you will have limited powers in that respect. You know, a lot of these powers sit with Westminster. But we're seeing within the Modern Slavery Bill the um, supply chains clause, which gives a legislative footing that does apply in Scotland. And there are other things that the Scottish Government could potentially do around procurement um, that, that, could, that could mean that we could start to, to use these sorts of tools. It's not an easy answer, it's not simple, but we could start to think about how we could do that as a government and how we could um, enact our, our requirements uh, under the, the business and human rights legislation that's coming from the UN. Okay, thank you. If I come to you, Mr Broadbent, in your evidence there's mention made of the supplier retail protocol. That's the same sort of philosophy, isn't it? And has that been successful? Is there any plans to roll it out further? 
Yes, it has been successful. It started off as a supermarket protocol with, uh, with the Big Six, then it went to the Big Ten. Uh, that was in 2010. Uh, in 2013, we um, distilled that down and made it more focused into two parts of the, uh, the supply chain. We licensed the gang masters, who are the labour providers, uh, but what we focused on with the protocol was the labour user, the people who actually pull the product out of the ground, and the retailer. Uh, that has developed and evolved into now uh, some accredited training between the GLA, the Ethical Trading Initiative, and the University of Derby, who can provide the trained accreditation. And there are a number of uh, supermarkets who are uh, literally queuing up to buy that accredited training, uh, which takes one step further than raising awareness. It actually trains people in spotting the signs securing best evidence without putting themselves or the workers at risk and then presenting that uh, to authorities who can then go on and investigate. But the, the most crucial issue about that training is, is to put in place systems and structures to prevent people from infiltrating legitimate supply chains in the first place, thus preventing exploitation at the very first point. So it's much more prevent-based than it is reactionary identifying things when they've already taken place. OK, thank you both very much. It's very helpful. I, I mean, I, I have to say again, and sometimes it's committee members, I mean, this is all good background. I, I don't want to stifle it, but we have to focus on, and I understand all the interlocking <coughs> legislation, we have to focus on the bill and how this will assist and if it's needed, but the failures are within it with regard to the limits of the legislation here and whether it can be amended. And I do want us to continue, committee, to focus in, uh, on, the, on the bill itself and whether there are clauses that deal with it or don't deal with it and conflicts, if we may do that from now on, please. Uh, Elaine. Well, I'm going to ask you about something that's not in the bill, actually. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, but it is a recommendation that which the STUC make, uh, Ms Martin, uh, that you criticise the bill for... Uh, not containing a provision for the criminalisation of the purchase of sex, and you made reference to that earlier <laughs> off, uh, uh, earlier on, and you, you make reference to what you say, the Nordic model, where uh, the purchase of sex is criminalised, but the sale of sex is decriminalised. And then f you also make reference to the Trafficking and Exploitation Act in Northern Ireland, uh, which does have a clause uh, which criminalises the purchase of sex, and you say there is little to stop a clause that criminalises the purchase of sex being included in this bill. The problem, I suppose, for the committee is that it's not, and that we've therefore not been able to take evidence uh, on what would be a fairly significant change, and a change to which I'm actually personally very, very sympathetic. Um, do you think it is as straightforward as that, that actually you could bring it in at stage two, or does it actually require a greater degree of uh, consultation, given the nature of the change? Um, well... I personally believe that you could bring it in at stage two as an amendment, and I think it would be perfectly it would be perfectly reasonable for the, the Scottish Parliament to decide whether they want a clause of that nature. Um, in my view, I think that there's no real reason not to have a clause of this nature, given that it has been shown in other countries to um, to reduce trafficking. Mm -hmm. So it does have a clear fit within this bill. Um, it's also not a massive change in the law as the law stands at present. At the law stands at present, prostitution is, is illegal. It is something that we, we don't want within our society. We are agreed upon that. So this is a change of emphasis in the law rather than a change of law itself, in that it's, it means that we are still trying to make prostitution illegal. We are just changing where the burden for that illegality lies, from the prostitute to the client. And for me, I think when you think about who is involved in prostitution and when you bring it through a trafficking lens as well, the vulnerability of those people who are involved in prostitution is so great that, and this bill already has provisions about not criminalising the victim, that I actually think that it makes sense to change where the, where the criminal responsibility lies onto the person who is coming out of their workplace quite happy in the evening and using their hard-earned cash to abuse women mm. and children. No, I mean, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm personally very sympathetic to the arguments. I'm just concerned that it might be a bit <coughs> wider than actually, you know, this is a bill about human trafficking and that, that, this was a, that sort of provision would be a bit wider than the scope of this bill. It is wider, it mm. is, because it would affect all prostitution. But as I say, mm. prostitution is already illegal. This is something that we already have a view on as a society. So... Um, 
in, in my view, I don't think that it's inconsistent from how we should be approaching trafficking within our society. And, you know, this is consistent as well with my evidence on the Labour side, that this is something that, should be, that we should try to tackle in the round, using every lever that we have possible. And, you know, the convener is quite rightly trying to get me to give evidence on the bill. And this is an area where the bill could be changed, and it is in our power to do so, and it would potentially disrupt the market for traffickers and make us a much less welcoming place for, for traffickers, a much more hostile destination for traffickers is maybe the better way to put it. Um, and it would ultimately defend vulnerable women. Thanks. I think the issue that my colleague is making is that it, it, at stage two, there's a limit to evidence that can be taken on what might be arguably a far range of whatever your views are on it, and that it might be difficult to do it at a stage two in the bill. And as I understand, in Northern Ireland, it came in the end of last year. Don't know the impact of that, whether it's been successful or driven underground or whatever, we just don't know. I think it's a big issue. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that it's, it's not worthy of dealing with. But I think the concern might be, and I, I don't know if other committee members have a view on that, but we'll no doubt discuss it when we come to deal with our report, whether or not it could be dealt with within the ambit of what we have before us and at this stage. That's, that's just the issue for us, I think. Gil, you want to come in? Yeah, you? yeah. well, it wasn't on that. I, I would like to say that I would think the committee would need uh, some more substantial evidence before we could do anything in, in reality. Uh, I know a lot of people are sympathetic to that. I personally am not, for different reasons. Not that I, that I support prostitution, but uh, I'm concerned about other areas uh, where it may uh, drive it underground. It's a, Something that's been going on since man and woman were born. So I really worry about that. It makes it more difficult to reach uh, people who really need help when you drive underground and, and you're not unable to expose it. But that's more a comment. Uh, but I, 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 uh, the question is more uh, on, on the bill itself. With luck. Totally. Well, a <laughs> fundamental question. I know that the STUC has got concerns with the definition. Uh, uh, and in that regard, I would like some comment on that. But I, I know that we have written evidence. We haven't had anyone before us, but we have written evidence from the Crown Office, the fac Faculty of Advocates, and the, the Edinburgh Bar Association. So the kind of legal beavers seem to at least be content, if not supportive. So, but I'd be grateful for your comments in that regard. Y yes, um, I through the course of doing my work on human trafficking, have uh, had a lot of discussions with various organisations, uh, including, including lawyers who specialise in this area. And there was a sort of consensus view coming through that there was some concern around the focus on the word uh, travel within the definition in Article 1, and that it didn't completely, it, it didn't completely cover the Article 4 uh, European Directive definition and basically the STC's position was that I think I think to be f to be clear the intention of the bill is to cover the entire article 4 definition because they try and tie up different elements of it in different ways later in the bill but the STC's view was 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 quite a simple one in that it is important to get the definition right. It's important that the definition is clear because the last thing we want to do is pass legislation and then spend a lot of time trying to pull back and saying, oh, no, but it means this or it means that when it goes out into the world and gets interpreted. And um, there, it seems to me anyway that if you have a clear definition at a European level that people are agreed on and people think is a good definition, why is that not put into this bill just as is so that we all know where we stand and we all know that it covers the entire definition. Mm. I'm, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I'm well convinced of that, that the, the emphasis on travel is, is misplaced. Uh, I think we've sort of come to that pretty early on with the evidence. Now, Jane, I know you say it's got nothing to do with the bill, but I'm hoping there's a 10 years link. <laughs> um, this is based on, on some um, responses that have been made this morning. I, I was wanting to go back to the the GLA licensing scheme, and I want to know um, how uh, labour providers are assessed to get a licence, how specific are the criteria, how specific are the standards, is there a lot of words like reasonable, um, or, or are there actual things that, that labour providers have to demonstrate, what evidence do you take, 
<clears throat> how do you know that labour providers are, are actually meeting the standards that they claim to meet and how is that monitored? Is it a one-off demonstration of those standards or, or do you go back and, and do spot checks? How, how is it regulated? Because you, sp you spoke about labour providers in unregulated sectors behaving quite badly and I, I just wonder how much evasiveness or how much avoiding of the standards goes on. That is Yay. excellent. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, two different processes. One is the application for a licence, uh, and a, either a new company or an entirely new company or a company who already operates in a different area, supplies uh, labour, uh, will ask for a licence. There are a, a number of thresholds to be met, uh, which includes uh, enquiries with all the other government agencies you would imagine, uh, a number of other checks, uh, and then that will involve a physical site visit as well to go and look. Uh, but sometimes if it's a new business, all you see is an empty room. Uh, if it's an existing business, there's much more to, uh, to go with. Uh, but the, the threshold needs to be met, uh, and essentially it all revolves around two specific things. One is that the licence holder, because it's issued to a particular person, that licence holder is fit and proper to hold a licence. And the second issue is uh, based around, and we are in the process of reviewing the GLA licensing standards, that we believe that person will adhere to the GLA licensing standards, which includes the International Labour Organisation indicators on forced labour that they won't withhold wages, restrict movements and, and, and other things. So that's the, the application. So someone has a licence and we then conduct compliance inspections which are entirely intelligence-led. So what we don't do is random checks. What we don't do is to decide to visit everybody two or three years because people know that we're coming. Uh, we will work exclusively off adverse intelligence received. Uh, that there may be something like withholding of wages, <coughs> holiday pay. Withholding of holiday pay, millions of pounds are withheld from workers at this moment in time, which appears low level until you realise the money involved and the interest that can be made, even now with interest rates, uh, from that money withheld. So it could start there right up to, it could be a piece of information that people are kept in outhouses, uh, in substandard accommodation with no water and electric and are being forced to work for pence for day or maybe not as much as that. We will do either individually on our own a announced <coughs> or unannounced inspection uh, or we could be there with HMRC, uh, the police or anybody else that can assist us with our inquiries. If there is immediate threat to life when we receive that or risk to life, we will action that straight away with the police and go around and rescue people. Uh, we are a first responder in relation to rescuing victims of human trafficking and we do that on a regular basis. Um, or more generally, we will go around conduct a compliance inspection against the 38 standards that we have which are part of the Gang Masters licensing regulations. And any one of those uh, could be contravened and some have different scores, but a total of 30 points could result in the revocation of a licence. That's clear, the industry knows it, and that's the bar with which they can't go over. There could be a number of minor standards that are breached that are just really process and procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be that passports have been withheld by the gang master. That is restriction of movement that could end up in a revocation of the licence and putting the business um, okay. out of business. Uh, what we do do, we are very mindful that when we do revoke a licence, we could immediately make a number of workers jobless and homeless. Right. So we work with the industry, uh, finding, helping them to find jobs and helping them to find accommodation <coughs> with other labour okay. providers. So we don't take any draconian action such as that in isolation. Focusing on the workers and the victims is absolutely key to what we do. And there's nothing in this bill that, that gets in the way of you performing those functions? And is there anything in the bill that would strengthen those functions or make your, your work easier? There's, there's nothing in the bill that gets in the way, thank you very much. In respect of uh, some of the other aggravating factors, uh, we've done a job recently where a number of female workers, if they didn't acquiesce to the unlicensed gang master, they basically had three choices, which was to uh, enter into a sham marriage, enter into prostitution, or donate an organ. 
donate being the loose word, that were the three difficult choices that those people were given to work with that organised crime group. Of course, they chose the sham marriage. Um, so there are another uh, raft of aggravating factors out there that will change all the time as criminals become more entrepreneurial. Yeah. So it's keeping a weather eye on what those trends are to make sure we can identify them quickly and effectively. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. Do the police have a, a database in Scotland, Police Scotland, of the licensed gang masters in Scotland so that if a report comes to them from some, let's say, a member of the public with concerns... The police can check whether or not they're licensed by yourselves and maybe breaching it or unlicensed and it's a criminal offence or there's criminality going on. At this point in time, Police Scotland don't, but what we have is an officer embedded in Gard Kosh um, right. who works uh, alongside the police all the time. So actually, there's no need for that because it comes in and they've got full access to our database, okay. uh, although the database sits with us. So if, if something happens in Scotland and there's, um, let's say it's a member of the public that sees something on caravans at a factory behind a high wall and suspect that there's forced labour going on in there, is, it the, is the usual route that they would phone the police? Um, or, you know, what would they do? I'm trying to get yeah. something on the record so if somebody suspects something's going on and that they can feel secure in reporting it. How would they go about it? Uh, they can ring the police, they can ring Crime Stoppers, they can ring the GLA. All those three numbers are out there already. Okay. Uh, and by ringing any one of those numbers, it will always come back to us. Right, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for your evidence. I, oh, I beg your pardon, Christian. I didn't see you'd no. come in again. Sorry, if, if I may, I just wanted to add something. For, for Miss Martin, you talked about an anti-slavery commissioner having a Scottish one. Would you think the same thing for the GLA? Would you think that... Maybe you could have a Scottish deal. Yeah, we, well, we proposed that in the past. I think uh, it depends on whether it would be compatible with the remit of the Scottish Parliament. But if it was possible to do so, we would be extremely uh, keen to do that because then we could uh, we we could we could do what we wanted in terms of what industries it covered and that and those sorts of things. Um, certainly, inspection and regulation is the sort of thing that can be devolved, and we have looked at that in other areas such as health and safety. Um, I think it's uh, hugely important that we get to grips with the fact that the GLA covers, it does a very good job in certain sectors, but there is a lot of abuse potentially happening in other sectors. We're extremely concerned about the maritime sector, the fish processing sector. Like we do think that there is, there are abuses happening there and those are not being covered by the GLA at the minute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sorry, Mr. Broadbent. Just to give you some reassurance, we are working with the maritime authorities, uh, both in Scotland, England, Northern Ireland and the Republic, but that's on an advisory capacity because we have no jurisdiction and no powers there. Thank you for this. I'm, I'm just uh, uh, saying that the committee could probably write to the UK government and ask whether there's any um, proposals to extend uh, your remit uh, to, uh, to encapsulate the other areas that are not met currently under the three headings that you have. Um, I don't know if the committee would want us to just do that, to see if there's any proposals as it links in with our uh, exploitation. Thank you very much. I suspend just for a couple of minutes uh, to allow witnesses to change places. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I now uh, to our second 
I'm going to call you a panel of one, <laughs> but uh, don't be frightened. Ian Crump, sure you are. Ian Cruxton, Director of the National Crime Agency Organised Crime Command, UK Human Trafficking Centre. And I can say to members who are aware, we also invited Immigration Enforcement at the Home Office to attend this panel, but they're unable to send a representative as they're involved in the Modern Slavery Bill, considered at Westminster today. Um, I think it's a bit disappointing. I understand why, but it's disappointing given their key role in relation to immigration and how sometimes it conflated with uh, trafficking. Uh, and I can discuss later with you whether we want to pursue this and have that uh, witnesses from there in front of us. So I'm going um, straight to questions from members. I look around and hope. John? Yes. <coughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Kirkson. I wonder the extent to which the problem of human trafficking's link to immigration makes the issue difficult to deal with for a number of agencies, yourself included? Um, certainly on occasions there are real difficulties with people, as uh, the convener mentioned, conflating the two issues. Um, we recognise that organised immigration crime uh, is one of the ways in which it provides a rich seam of people who are potentially available, available for exploitation. So from an international perspective, one of the things that we see regularly is people who begin their journey to the UK, to Scotland, uh, often as some form of economic migrant or fleeing a conflict area or something of that nature, where they have willingly entered into an agreement with people who will assist them on that journey. Uh, and then quite often during the course of that journey, they fall into the hands of people who see them as ripe for exploitation and strip them away from uh, the kind of... Um, control over their own lives that they, they would routinely have. So there's a, a really important point there around organised immigration crime is absolutely one of the rich, fertile grounds by which we see people who ultimately end up exploited, whether on their route to the UK or ultimately within the UK. Um, but there's a really important point as well, which we've already touched on in the earlier session, which is around the degree to which uh, people who are uh, already Scottish nationals, uh, UK nationals, uh, have never left the country or are perfectly at liberty to remain within the country are nevertheless exploited hugely and there's some real vulnerable people. So it's very important that we always make the distinction between the two. Uh, certainly as the National Crime Agency, uh, I've, uh, as the convener mentioned, I've got the, the Human Trafficking Centre sits under one of the areas that I've got responsibility for. Um, but one of the things that we're doing now is actively seeking to make a clearer distinction between organised immigration crime and the issues around human trafficking and modern slavery, but at the same time recognising where there are linkages between them. And, and, and we heard the terms um, human smuggling and human trafficking. And it, it would, is that where the status may change or there may, someone may retain the, the, that, that status throughout the time, but it's still a crime, is that correct? Um, we, we, I mean, there, there's a, a clear definition in terms of human trafficking, which is the Palermo Protocol, which is what we, we tend to operate to. Um, there are some additional uh, subtleties in terms of the modern slavery bill, uh, in terms of describing some of the categories of people that there is concern may not necessarily automatically fall under the definition of human trafficking. People smuggling is a different issue where um, the, the language I've used in the past is that in some of the other areas of criminality that I have responsibility for, the, the commodity that is moved is agnostic. So drugs, firearms are areas that I also have responsibility for. They don't have an opinion, they don't have an attitude, they don't have a, a desire to hide, or they're not coerced uh, or bullied or subject to having their, their uh, support mechanisms stripped away. The real difference with this is the distinction between when the commodity is a person. So people smuggling from that perspective we see as people who are willingly entering into a, a journey uh, as opposed to people who are human trafficking when they are used very much as a commodity. And, and clearly it's important that this is done on an international basis. This parliament will legislate, but it's important that the legislation dovetails with elsewhere in the UK, the European Union and indeed beyond. Are, are you content that that is the case with this legislation? Yes, we, we believe that the, the legislation works very comfortably alongside both the legislation uh, of the, the Modern Slavery Bill uh, and also the way in which we work with our international partners. There's extensive cooperation both at the European level with Europol and the impact projects in respect of this. Uh, and the National Crime Agency manages an international liaison officer network worldwide, which is one of the niche and unique capabilities that we provide for um, Scotland. 
uh, and through that you are able to access uh, our international network, uh, both in terms of securing intelligence, getting operational activity underway, and also on occasions launching joint operations with international partners. So there's a, there's a really important relationship there. Of course, as always, there is more that we could do. Um, but nevertheless, we have significantly realigned resources over the last couple of years to ensure that we are now starting to place people into geographical locations worldwide, which traditionally we may not have done based on an improved understanding around the nature of human trafficking. And, and can I ask about the specific distinction of Scots law, and in particular law in relation to children? Are you content that, for instance, your organisation is sufficiently versed to understand the different approach that's taken to the well-being of children? Legislative uh, framework. Which, which particular aspect, sorry? Well, well in, in the past, for instance, issues around Dungavel and people being placed there, juveniles being placed there, that's no longer the case. It is the case south, elsewhere in the UK. Are, are your staff versed on the different approach that's taken to children? I, I'd have to come back to you on that point, I'm afraid. I, I don't have the detail around that. Sorry. OK, thank you very much indeed. Thank I you. want to just take you back to the idea of willingly. It's a very tricky distinction to make between somebody who agrees uh, to be smuggled into a country for, and somebody who is... I'll, I'll keep with the coming from outside, although I agree with the, the, the difficulties that definition is trafficked, because in the bill it says, quite frankly, at one subsection two, it's irrelevant whether the other person consents to any part of the arrangement, because one of the issues that arose with us when we visited and we went out in early visits was the person may not think they're being trafficked, for we would, looking outside, but because of the nature of their experience elsewhere, they, they're, they're, they think this is fine, it's OK, they don't, their criteria is very different. It must make it complex, therefore, to distinguish between... I know you try to say the transition, but it may be that, in fact, that person... I think one of the issues we raised when I was with Alison McInnes um, at uh, Bernardo's was that was trying to get someone to see that that's exactly what had happened to them. They didn't, they didn't see that as their journey, and then it took a lot of them to understand they'd actually been trafficked and exploited. So I think it's, it is difficult, is it not, to draw lines and say... And that's what makes the conflation... Difficult sometimes to disentangle as well. Uh, convenient, you're absolutely right. I apologise if my slightly sloppy language in terms no, of no, willingness. No, no, I just... But, um, uh, clearly there are some instances where we, we can see that uh, an individual, a family group, uh, actually pay formally to be moved from one location to another. Um, in those kind of circumstances, it's hard to, to not um, uh, assess that in those instances people have actually entered into some kind of a willing um, uh, engagement relationship with the people who may well be managing that, that transition. Um, but you're absolutely right. There is huge complexity in this. We have real difficulties on occasions persuading people many weeks and months after they come into contact with uh, either the National Crime Agency, police service or, or others in the victim support arena that, they, uh, that the people who have, uh, from our perspective, exploited them and trafficked them are anything other than friends, the people yes. who have acted as a support mechanism for them because they may not have had experience of that kind of a relationship previously yeah. in their lives. It is hugely complex. Yep. Thank you. Roderick. Um, morning. Um, the UK Human Trafficking Centre is a competent authority for the purposes of the national referral mechanism. Um, that's obviously been subject um, to a review recommendation using multidisciplinary panels replacing kind of the role of your agency. Are you able to help us with your comments on how it's been working up to now and, and what your view is on, on where, where we go from here yeah. in, that, in that respect? OK. Um, it, it, in rather than replacing the agency, the, yeah. a little bit of the history around this yeah. was that back in 2009, um, the, uh, the responsibilities around human trafficking moved to uh, the then Serious Organised Crime Agency. Uh, and uh, with that, there, it was identified that there was a requirement to start to record those instances when we came into contact with potential victim, victims of trafficking. Uh, as a result, we self-resourced the creation of the national referral mechanism and the infrastructure that went with that. Um, 
over the past few years, we have had to continually supplement the resourcing in there, uh, actually from operational resources, just to uh, continue to handle what has been an increasing volume of referrals year on year. So that's been sort of some of the, the history to it. Um, within the review, what we have made by way of our submission from an operational perspective to the Home Office who led the review, was that this was predominantly, the national referral mechanism as it currently operates is predominantly an administrative process. It isn't an intelligence process, it isn't designed to be an intelligence process. And as such, our submission was that that is something which would be better handled by uh, the Home Office or a, another organisation that was better prepared and equipped to deal with that, so that actually we could get on with the law enforcement aspect of this, of trying to identify, uh, tackle the, the traffickers sitting behind this and bring those people to justice, and also to assist in preventing other people falling into the hands of those individuals. So that was the submission, and that was the basis on which uh, the review heard evidence from the National Crime Agency. Um, there's been a, a range of recommendations on the back of that, and you're quite right, the, the proposal around uh, creation of uh, multidisciplinary panels is the, the, the preferred sort of recommendation in terms of the way forward. Um, so our intention is that that will, at some stage, uh, still to be determined, transfer away from the National Crime Agency to the Home Office. Uh, and at that stage, we are anticipating reinvesting the resources that we currently tie up doing the uh, referral mechanism and that are currently resourcing that. We're seeking to reinvest those into our intelligence development to identify more and tackle more organised crime groups. Thank you. In the sense that you talked about um, the mechanism being administrative rather than intelligence-based, um, without wishing to draw you on policy issues, but is there a significant problem in therefore having a kind of a, a Scottish national referral mechanism or administrative unit? Um, um, I think that is a policy decision, but nevertheless, um, I think the only thing that I would say is um, we have a really, really good relationship with the National Human Trafficking Unit in Police Scotland. Um, that works incredibly well. Uh, at the moment, they utilise the services of the National Referral Mechanism. Uh, anything that would seek to reduce the effectiveness of that relationship, I think, would need to be looked at long and hard. Uh, and also, the ability of us to draw down on the, res the um, analysis of what is happening within uh, human trafficking has been a powerful contributor to the journey that we've been on over the last few years. We've been able to do that because we've been able to compare figures like for like over a, a range of periods. If there were to be duplication or a shift in the nature of the analysis, it would mean that we'd start to lose some of the distinction around that. So it may well be that it's the right decision. That clearly is a, a policy decision. Um, uh, but I would just uh, counsel that anything that does has to improve what we're doing currently as opposed to uh, just changing it. OK, thank you. Thanks, Roderick. Uh, Elaine, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, are there any evidence? I think you made reference to the fact that you used the definition of trafficking contained in Article 4 of the Council of Europe, Europe Trafficking Convention. Am I correct there? Yeah. Um, this bill does not. Uh, this bill has a different definition, uh, and other witnesses have suggested that it should be amended to reflect the uh, Council of Europe Convention's definition. Do you think that you, would that be your view that it should should replicate what's said in the Convention? We, we found um, the, the, the benefit of it replicating um, the, the European standard being one that, uh, in terms of unlocking international cooperation, mm -hmm. you are aligning it to something which is readily acknowledged, identified, and often embedded in statute in countries around the world. So rather than arguing about the nuance of specific new words or new phrases that might be introduced, you're actually already adopting a standard that people readily recognise and understand. So that, that's been our experience of it. We certainly, in the discussions around the modern slavery bill, uh, we, our advice from an operational perspective was not to complicate um, by trying to, to alter and create a new definition in respect of modern slavery. But of course, we did acknowledge at the same time that that was ultimately a policy decision. Um, but but the, the slavery bill, as it stands currently, does not seek to redefine that. We've also heard concerns, in fact, you've referred to the fact that people can be trafficked without travelling, that travel is not necessarily uh, a part of um, trafficking, and yet this bill does seem to, in its definition, focus on travel. Now, if, we, if it was reworded in the way that you suggest, would that no longer be a concern? Would that actually mean that the definition was more encompassing and, and could recognise the fact that people could be trafficked from within Scotland, for example? 
we, we've always taken the view that the, the, the wider definition, the, the, um, uh, the European definition, uh, actually is sufficiently broad that you can utilise uh, the same definition to define those individuals that might not geographically move around, might not cross mm -hmm. a land boundary, but may, for example, pass through the hands of different individuals uh, who might be seeking to exploit people. So, yes, we believe that that covers it. Would that in any way assist with the sort of conflation of the issues with immigration? Would that be of assistance to have a... Yeah. 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 Sorry. Would it assist in terms of decoupling it with... I mean, there's been concerns raised about the conflation with mm. trafficking with immigration issues. Actually, would that definition actually help to decouple that? I think it does, because it very clearly doesn't specifically yeah. make reference to Absolutely. borders and boundaries. Thanks. Margaret? You've covered the, the aspect that you um, deal really with enforcement, NRM is essentially administration, but is there an issue about establishing the credibility of, of the person in front of you in order to establish if NRM kicks in, the support is, is available? And is there a time frame within this um, where you have to establish that when the, the victim is maybe quite confused in a vulnerable state. Are these issues that are of concern to you? Um, they are. The, the current national referral mechanism works on the basis of um, a five-day five time frame for establishing reasonable grounds um, for suspecting that the person is a, uh, a victim of trafficking, uh, and then a 45-day time frame for providing conclusive grounds uh, the information for that is provided from the referring organisation, first responder organisations, police forces and others. Um, uh, and those are the time frames. The five day one is something that we in particular are uh, very strong on ensuring that we, we meet. Uh, because that's the point at which if we identify that somebody is, we believe, uh, on those reasonable grounds, a victim of trafficking or potential victim of trafficking rather, uh, that's the point at which it unlocks the victim support mechanisms, etc., so we can make sure that that person's moved to a place of safety and uh, looked after in that way. Um, the 45-day threshold is more challenging for us. Um, some of the more horrendous cases that we see, it can take 45 days for a victim to even start to speak. Um, and so that's something which is much more challenging, but, but dare I say it, by then at least we can be confident that we've got the right support mechanisms around them and the victim support in place. Okay, thank you. I think, I th I think I'm correct in saying, however, it's a paper exercise. You never, uh, I think I would have concerns that on paper, somebody might sound very much like they've come here as an illegal migrant, but in fact they are trafficked. And that, in, and I don't know whether it's practical to do this, but that being able to see somebody and speak to them makes a huge difference to what's on a bit of paper. Is that an issue? I mean, you're, you're correct that it is a paper exercise. It's conducted on It's a very detailed breakdown of information which is, is presented both at the initial phase and at the subsequent phase. So there is a lot of information that goes in there. Um, of, of course, in some instances, it, it would be fantastic to sit down with the individual, but that's not the... the if you couldn't do that for every single person, no. then you would immediately... Do you be do it for anybody? Uh, n not at that stage, I don't believe, but I'll, I'll confirm for definite and, and come back to you if, if that is the case. So who fills in the, the, the form? Who fills it in? The, the people who come into contact with the potential victim of trafficking. So whether that's a police force, uh, a, a approved uh, governmental body, uh, other first responder organisations, they complete what is a, a very comprehensive um, uh, form. And then, of course the person who is believed to be the victim of trafficking has to give their consent as well to actually enter into the national referral mechanism. Yeah, and that could be difficult if they've not got English as a language. I wanted just to pursue this a bit further about, is there a, an approved list of people who can refer? There is an approved yes. list. Um, are organisations who <coughs> deal with um, voluntary sectors, third sector, who deal with um, victims of trafficking and exploitation, are they people who fill in these forms? Uh, in many instances, yes, they are. Quite useful to know the list because I, I, I think we did have some criticism of the national referral mechanism in that it was a bit of a paper... I'm not, I'm not you know, um, attacking a person, but it was a bit of a paper exercise and, it, and that people fall through 
because it's that, and they're not identified, uh, as I said earlier, with also with John Finney, when people don't consider there have been traffic, but, but you know, some time spent talking. I don't mean you need to do it with everybody. I mean, there may be black and white cases, you know, yeah. when you say, absolutely, uh, yeah, there's not an issue here, you know, they've come in this, or obviously, but there must be people very vulnerable who don't have English, uh, any English as, their, as a language, who really are being done a disservice, perhaps, by what we do, by putting them through that and treating them as illegal, and they are indeed being trafficked um, and not aware of it. And as I say, from what we went in our meeting, it was obvious that it took some time, months sometimes, for people to appreciate that what's happened to you across several continents. I mean, we saw one trail, I think I'm correct, that was over two years, a person being moved, I don't to keep the travel there, but being moved, no idea that they were, as you might have said, being used as a commodity uh, across it. So I, I would quite like, I think, to, to um, on behalf of the committee, to have a list of those organisations who are referred to the National Referral Mechanism. Okay. I don't know if anybody else wants to come in on that particular point, but I think that was something that was of callous and you want to say, because you were there, and that was something I think you felt too. No, I agree with you, Commissioner. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. Arrows on the list, and they were very... Um, very keen to, to look at the 45-day um, window frame, which they thought was inadequate, and also the issue of consent. Having spoken with a, a traffic person, it was quite clear that she had no idea what the national referral mechanism yeah. was, so that must raise few, huge questions about how effective it is. Yeah. Christian, is that you wanted to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to add to it as well that it's not only a vulnerability because of languages, it's vulnerability as well. I don't know how much there is an assessment made to know if the people have got learning disabilities, for example. Yeah. It, uh, clearly, we can't assess that the first time we come into contact with people and first responders can't, but part and parcel of put, putting the appropriate victim support alongside people actually does... Uh, take account of a range of different issues uh, in respect of that. That's for us. That's managed by in England and Wales by the Salvation Army. Uh, I understand in Scotland it's dealt with by Tara in respect of uh, sexual exploitation and migrant help for for other types. So there is a, a range of support functions in there, and of course, depending upon the nature of the activity. So some of our pre-planned uh, operations. We're very clear what we're going into, both in terms of language requirements and other things. It's more tricky when you first come into contact with someone where you weren't expecting it. I, I particularly wanted to know, that document uh, uh, with the questions uh, which you make your assessment, uh, I would love to have the details of it, and particularly if there are questions about the, uh, the, uh, the ability of the person to be able to respond to this questionnaire. Okay. Is the, is the form online? Uh, I don't believe it's online. Well, it would be useful if we... It is. Oh, I'm told it is. Sorry. It is. <laughs> I see the sport. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, I think we just, we'll just we look into this. And anything further you can give, in particular with the list of organisations in Scotland that are um, designated to refer and the process, a little bit more about it, would be very, very useful to the committee. Certainly, it, it, there is an approved list of organisations. Yes, uh, that would be useful. Is that again so online? What, or what that's do. online too, right. We can find that so for ourselves. It's all on the Home Office website. I'm reliably uh, okay, informed. Okay, thank you. I, no, other, uh, no other questions. Thank you very much, Mr Crux. And that concludes this evidence session. And we now move into private uh, session as agreed previously. Thank you very much.